Massachusetts, and he has earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry at Delta University and a Master of Science in Natural Science from Delta State University. In addition to those degrees, Dr. Brothers has also earned a Master of Public Policy and Administration degree from Mississippi State and a PhD from Jackson State University in Urban Higher Education. Dr. Brothers currently serves as an Associate Dean in the Graduate School and Director of the Office of Inclusive Excellence and Professional Enhancement. He is a past Associate Director for Diversity Enhancement for the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis and an Adjunct Assistant Professor of Political Science. Dr. Brothers is an advocate of recruiting, retaining, and graduating more underrepresented students with graduate degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. He has served as a co-PI for the Program of Excellence and Equity in Research, and um, which is an NIH-funded training grant to recruit, retain, and graduate more underrepresented minorities with PhDs in biomedical and behavioral science fields. Before arriving at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, he served at the Peach State Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, Executive Director at the University of Georgia. During his tenure in Mississippi, Dr. Brothers served at the Lewis Stokes Mississippi Alliance for Minority Participation site, Coordinator Assistant Professor of Chemistry at Delta State University. He also worked at the Mississippi State Chemical Laboratory as an herbicide pesticide residue chemist and a laboratory project director for the Analytical Food Safety Laboratory, located in the College of Veterinary Medicine at the Mississippi State University. Dr. Brothers' research interests are the following retention of underrepresented minorities in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics at majority institutions, managing diversity, generational diversity, holistic graduate missions, networking, network mentoring, and cross-culture mentoring. And so that will, is the topic um, for today's seminar is cross-cultural um, mentoring. And um, I will hand over um, the floor to Dr. Brothers um, to take it away. Well, thank you for that uh, gracious, um... I guess you could say a uh, description of my work. And, and, uh, and I'm most appreciative of that anytime I hear it, I'm like, man, I must be getting old uh, at this point. But thank you nonetheless. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for your presence this afternoon at uh, 2.03 p.m. I hope that your research thus far this summer is going well. Uh, summer research is an exciting opportunity. So I've been asked today to give a presentation as it relates to cross-cultural mentoring. Uh, before I get into the presentation, I will say that the presentation itself will consist of some language and dialogue around diversity itself, and then we'll have some discussions about what mentoring is, how mentoring can be defined. We'll talk about some phases of mentoring as well. We'll talk about mentoring relationships, and then we'll delve into exactly what cross-cultural mentoring is. And so I'm going to share my screen real quick, and we will move forward with this presentation. Okay. And so before I start, I would like to say when I think about diversity, uh, I view diversity in many respects like a living library. And what I mean by that is, is though many of you uh, did not have your cameras on, which is okay, but I view diversity somewhat like a living library. And so uh, whenever you, with Zoom these days, whenever I look on Zoom and I see numerous uh, faces occupying those squares, uh, I look at it like book covers. And so when you think about a library, you think about a library that consists of many books, and every book has a unique cover. However, you can't have an appreciation of that book until you've had an opportunity to read some of the chapters of your life. And that's how I view diversity. So any person you come in contact with you can look at them as being a very unique book that has some very unique chapters as it relates uh, to their life and what their aspirational goals are. So let's get started here. So when we think about uh, diversity as the United States continues to evolve into a truly multicultural society, 
uh, with remarkable cultural, racial, and, and ethnic diversity, uh, we will clearly require further changes in the nature of higher education. And so as the world uh, continues to evolve, higher education in like fashion has to evolve with it as well. And so when we think about diversity in the workplace and what's interesting about some of the authors I've selected, you'll see some that date back to the late 90s and early 90s and early 2000s. But what's interesting about some of these quotes is, is like some of this is actually coming to fruition. So we know from Denton, he says, a greater tolerance for differences will be essential in the culture of the 21st century. In the near future, employees are a lot more likely to have different backgrounds. And that's true today. I would change one word from greater tolerance to greater appreciation uh, for differences. And we know now compared with the workforce of even 20 years ago, more white women, people of color, uh, people with disabilities, new and recent immigrants, those from the LGBTQ community, intergenerational mixes. So we're in a unique situation now where in the workforce, you might even still see those that are said to be traditionalists, baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and now Gen Z. They are all now making up our workforce. So a couple of thoughts on diversity. Uh, these may be new to some. Uh, diversity needs to be conceptualized not only from the perspective of access, that is admissions, recruitment, and financial aid, but also and equally importantly, from the perspective of a campus as a learning environment for different kinds of learners. So the idea when we think about higher ed, we cannot narrow the focus for one type of learner, but we try to make sure that uh, it provides an environment, a learning environment for all the different types of learners. And we also know that the challenge of diversity is not simply to have it, but to create conditions in which its potential to be a performance barrier is minimized and its potential to enhance performance is maximized. So one diversity as it relates to, uh, one definition as it relates to diversity from a higher ed perspective. Diversity in higher education is a systematic blending of academic programs, recruitment, retention, policies, and curriculum that provide college students with an enriched multicultural environment for learning. So we'll note here from a higher ed perspective, uh, our intentionality as it relates to our academic programs, how we go about recruitment, how we put mechanisms in place for retention, the policies that are established, the curriculum that's in design is for the purpose and intentionality of creating a multicultural environment for learning. So when we think about uh, mentoring, there are two terms we often hear. Uh, we hear mentoring and we hear advising. And these two terms are not synonymous with each other. They're actually different. So we know that genuine mentoring involves a far deeper relationship with the student than is just the role of advising the student. And we'll know that advising is in fact a role of mentoring, but not the mentoring process itself. So mentoring often involves career socialization, inspiration and belief in each other, and promoting excellence and passion for work through guidance, protection, support, and networking. And you note here this definition said is inspiration and belief in each other. And we're going to learn later that when we talk about mentoring, it's not a one directional relationship. It's actually a reciprocal relationship between both the mentor and the mentee. So Healy defines mentoring as a dynamic, reciprocal relationship in a work environment between an advanced career incumbent, defined as the mentor and a beginner, protege, protege and mentee are often used synonymously, aimed at promoting the career development of both. So what that tells us, both the mentor and the mentee contribute to the mentoring relationship. Oftentimes students feel that they have nothing to add uh, to, the, to the mentoring relationship because often they see the mentor in a position of power and authority. But we'll note that from a dynamic reciprocal relationship standpoint, there's an expectation that both the mentor and the mentee um, will contribute to this relationship. And this is made possible because when we think about what could a uh, potential mentee add to a mentor, 
Well, if we thought about it, say, and we mentioned it earlier from a generational standpoint, you might have a mentor that's a baby boomer or a Gen Xer, and you might be a Gen Z. Well, because of those generational differences, there's something to offer. Or uh, you may have served in the military. And so from a professional standpoint, there's something that you could uh, provide and add to the, to the knowledge base of that mentor as well. Oh, let me go back one. So when we think about uh, mentor roles, and there are several roles of mentor, this is not an exhaustive list. So when you think about mentors, they can occupy the role of a listener or supporter. They can be a resource person. They can be a champion. They can be a strategist. Uh, they could be a role model, they could be a sounding board, uh, they could help you make lifestyle and image makeovers, they can be a coach, they can be an advisor or a guide. And I can assure you, if you ask most mentors to occupy all of these different roles, it will probably run from you. And so one idea is the idea of having a network of mentors. In other words, you're not trying to identify this one-all, be-all person to occupy these different roles. And I encourage students uh, to create what I call a board of directors as it relates to mentoring networks. That is, you identify various mentors that are on your team or your board of directors for the purpose of helping you accomplish your aspirational goals. So when we think about mentoring relationship, there are actually four phases. There's an initiation phase, there's a cultivation phase, there's a separation phase, and there's a re redefinition phase. And oftentimes these phases are not really thought about. Sometimes they happen organically, but to give you some context and structure, the initiation phase is just that. That's when both the mentor and the mentee sit down for the first time to basically lay out what the expectations are from that relationship. Um, typically what's used to kind of drive that along is what's referred to as an IDP or individual development plan. And it's just a good uh, tool to utilize where the mentee is basically laying out what their goals and objectives are. And the mentor has an opportunity to compare that with what I like to say reality to see if you can actually accomplish that. In the initi initiation phase, this is where both the mentor and the mentee establish times to meet. They establish uh, when and how often. Uh, they determine what's the best mechanism for communication. For example, the mentor and mentee might say, well, we will meet once a week, we'll meet at a coffee shop or we'll meet at my office. Uh, however, uh, the mentor and the mentee are deciding how they will go about establishing this relationship. This is all started in the initiation phase. When you get to the cultivation phase, I like to say this is when reality meets what you hoped you would be able to accomplish. So maybe you thought you might be able to meet once a week, but Due to time constraints, it might be every other week or it could potentially be once a month. But the cultivation phase, you're basically honing what's actually working in the relationship itself. Then there's the separation phase. And this is where the relationship is substantially altered, either emotionally or structurally. So what they're saying is, is that once you have a mentor, that mentor does not have to be for life. And so a mentor could be for a week, it could be for the duration, say, of the summer research program. Uh, it could be for a month, six months, a year, but it does not necessarily have to be for life. And so when the mentoring relationship is no longer beneficial for both the mentor and the mentee, then you have the option of separating. And so, and hopefully it'll be an annual separation. But the idea is, is that you're, you're not tethered or uh, held to be with that mentor for life. Then you have what's called the redefinition phase. And so in the redefinition phase, both individuals continue to have some contact on an informal basis in order to continue the mutual support created in earlier years. So an example of this would be my mentor, uh, Dr. Joseph Stevenson. He was the uh, executive director of the PhD program that I completed. And so while I was in the program, um, once again, my interest was always recruitment and retention of underrepresented minorities uh, in STEM. And so once I graduated with my PhD and started really, really working in that arena, then my mentor would contact me if he had a situation where he was trying to either figure out a problem or identify best strategies 
um, or uh, recruitment and retention of underrepresented minorities in STEM. So at this point, our roles changed. So rather than me being the mentee, I became the mentor. And so therefore our relationship had been redefined. And so this also takes place. So once again, the four phases, the initiation phase, the cultivation phase, the separation phase, and the redefinition, redefinition phase. And so looking through these lands of these different phases gives you context as the relationship evolves. So in mentoring relationships, the basis and purpose of the relationship is the guiding, advising, and supporting of the protege's growth. And I'll add here, there should be caring, mutual respect, trust, and regard in both parties. Uh, there is a transfer and sharing of information, tips, and expertise in the process of mentoring. And then lastly, the mentor helps the protege learn and integrate into a new role or stage of personal, academic, or professional development. When we consider some new paradigms in mentoring, we note here from Dietrich and Watson, perhaps the best way to deal with differences in our increasingly diverse world and the world of mentoring female, minority, and international students is to change the present structure. And I may mention earlier that the higher ed structure also had to alter and change as the world alters and changes. Koken here posits that the context of mentoring includes the cultural mores, of the individuals involved in cultural aspects within the organization and society in which they are functioning. And their connectedness and belonging are critical to academic achievement. It is vital for universities to provide a high quality mentoring experience. And so we'll know for any student, uh, if there's no sense of connectedness and belonging, then most likely that student will not persist. So mentoring plays a vital role in assisting and helping students feel this connectedness and belonging. Some barriers we note to success in higher education, and these are not uncommon, uh, racism and discrimination, alienation and isolation, and then access to resources and information. And mentoring can help students get through some of these barriers as well. So when we talk about cross-cultural mentoring, uh, Navigating a multicultural environment requires mentoring from a cross-cultural context. And David and Foster Johnson argue that a major flaw of traditional mentoring programs is the exclusion of differences uh, between racial and ethnic groups. And we'll note that cross-cultural mentoring may be defined as a mentoring process whereby the mentor establishes a relationship with the protege from a personal, cultural, social, political, and historical context. What I like to say is the mentor has to get into the DNA of the individual that's in front of them. And the reason that this is important, if a mentor does not take into consideration uh, a protege's personal, cultural, and uh, historical context, then they might put them at risk when they immerse them into a new culture or new environment. And we'll note here that due to the complexities of cross-cultural mentoring, Mentors need certain attributes or abilities, including selflessness, active listening skills, honesty, a non-judgmental attitude, persistence, patience, and an appreciation for diversity. And some, some of you might be saying to yourself, where is that person? And so unless you know that these are some unique attributes that you should look for in a mentor as it relates to cross-cultural mentoring. So some benefits of cross-cultural mentoring. One, it facilitates a deeper understanding between the mentor and the protege. Uh, it fosters a rapport. It enhances trust. It builds ease and comfort of communication. And then it helps the protege feel understood. So to give you an example uh, of cross-cultural mentoring, and I just saw a misspelled cultural at the top there. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, but to give you an, ex an example of that, I have a colleague, her name is Dr. Rachel Ray, not Rachel Ray the cook, but Dr. Rachel Ray. And, uh, and she works here on campus uh, and set on global education, global uh, engagement. And so uh, Dr. Ray and I, at one point, we were both recruiters. And so oftentimes we would have different interactions and conversations. And uh, Rachel noticed that one of my hobbies was cooking. And much of what I cooked 
I post on Facebook, uh, I have a section on my page called Cooking with Dr. B. It's just my hobby. And so she noticed that and she said, well, Dr. B, she said, I want to uh, give you something. I said, well, what's that, Rachel? She said, I want to give you an authentic cookbook from China. I was like, really? So yeah. So I'm excited and I never had a cookbook from China. And so she sends it via campus mail. I decided to wait till I got home to open it. So when I get home, I open it. And as I'm flipping through it, a couple of things that I noticed. One, there were no pictures. And two, it was all in Mandarin. And so I'm like, Rachel, what's the deal? What am I supposed to do with this? And so she explained to me what she would do. She would translate the recipe, give me the history of that dish. And then my challenge would be to prepare it. So a mechanism for us to exchange cultures actually took place via food. So there are different ways that you can have these cultural uh, exchanges. And I think when you do that, uh, you get a glimpse when you get into the, the history, the background of the person that you're interacting with. And that enhances trust and it also builds a rapport. And then it makes communication a lot easier as well. So some recommendations for mentors and cross-cultural mentoring. One, mentors should assess their awareness of and attitudes towards issues of race, ethnicity, and culture, both for themselves and their mentees. They should educate themselves about the culture of their mentees. And then lastly, be aware of each individual's point of racial identity development and its impact on the relationship. And I've spent a lot of time talking about what mentors should do, but this is what protégés should do. Proteges or mentees should be responsive. They should have good follow through. They should be open to feedback. They should be willing to be guided and mentored. They should be open about self, which includes personal strengths and weaknesses. And as I indicated to you earlier, uh, mentoring is a dynamic reciprocal relationship. So that lets you know that it goes both ways and you only get out what you put in. In our closing thought, mentoring is not an all or nothing relationship. Mentors may provide some or all of the mentoring roles and the provision of these roles may not only vary from relationship to relationship, but they may also vary over time in a given relationship. And so what that's telling us is, is that the role that a mentor plays uh, in your life can change over time as you grow and progress uh, your needs uh, change in that growth and process. And so as I tell students as it relates to network mentoring and having your board of directors, as you continue to evolve and grow into your career, then your mentoring network will also change uh, during that time as well. All right, and this is to let you know that I did not make this up. Uh, references that you can look at later we can open it up for questions as well. Uh, this is my contact information if you need to find me. Uh, there's our website. We do have a Facebook presence. We are on LinkedIn and we are on Twitter as well in the WAD school. And I will stop sharing. Take a few questions if you have any. Sure, I, I have one if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, how would you suggest going about finding mentors? I guess outside of, you know, doing the research program this summer, um, how would you go about finding kind of that network, um, finding multiple different mentors? I think the way to, to find multiple different mentors is using existing ones that you have. You know, say for instance, if, if you're already interacting with a faculty mentor, you can begin to uh, ask about his or her network. And who's within that work network and how that person might add or bring um, insight to, you know, uh, things that you're doing or uh, a couple of other ways when we think about mentors, both internal and external. So here this summer, you'll probably come in contact with a lot of quote unquote internal mentors, but they can also lead you to some external mentors as well. I think there's benefit. Uh, and interacting with as many people as you can during the summer research program, because keep this in mind, uh, for every mentor that you have, they have a network and their network can become your network. So I would just encourage leveraging the opportunities that you have to 
uh, interact with your current mentors and then explore and see what mentors they have that could benefit you as well. Uh, thank you. Oh, absolutely. Good question. a 30 second delay to let people think. You can also drop it in the chat, you know, if you That's true. would rather. I guess I asked this question, does everyone have a mentor? And one thumbs up. Excellent, excellent. The other question I will ask, do the phases of mentoring relationships help you now? Have you, have you ever been exposed to those phases of mentoring? And now that you have, do you think that would give you some additional context now when you interact uh, with your mentor? And you can place it in the chat if you like. I think at least for me, um, it's not really something that I've ever like thought about. I mean, I've known my mentor, I was a professor of mine from a previous semester. So I've known him for a little bit, um, but it's not really something I thought about. Um, so just like having that context and that structure, I guess kind of makes it seem, I think the point that you made about uh, me being the mentee, not really feeling like I contribute anything to the relationship um has been something that i've felt um but kind of having you know like it's at the point that you brought up about um myself being able to contribute to the relationship kind of makes me think about it in a different way excellent and that's an important point and i think you know to me that comes from an old paradigm as we think about mentoring that it has to be that all the knowledge and expertise resided in one place and that the mentee had nothing to contribute and so uh, I think it's just the opposite um, because we're all <clears throat> excuse me, unique individuals and we all have something to bring to the table. And despite you know, where you may be academically, and I think that's the dynamic that students struggle the most with, uh, even when you get to graduate school, uh, there's that question in the back of your mind, you're like, you know, what can I possibly uh, contribute to this professor? They, they're published, they, they got grants. You know, here I am, I just finished my undergrad degree and my master's degree, what can I contribute? And I felt that myself because my mentor, he had five degrees, he was provost, he was published scholar, author, you know, and I'm sitting there wondering, what is it that I, can I possibly contribute? But we also have to keep this in mind too. Uh, even when you get a PhD, you don't have all the knowledge that's out there. You have one slice of all the knowledge that's out there. So there's always something that you could potentially contribute. But more importantly, you look for opportunities to have these ex exchanges. So it could be a generational exchange, it could be a professional uh, exchange as well, or it could be a cultural uh, exchange. So look for those opportunities to have those exchanges between your mentor and your mentee. Also keep in mind, if, if you don't have any questions now, uh, feel free to reach out to me at your convenience. Uh, if there are questions as it relates to not only mentoring, but if it's questions related to graduate school in general, if it's questions related to uh, career and trajectory, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And I know with Zoom, it makes it awkward sometimes uh, to ask questions, but if you have some questions that you think of later, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. <clears throat> 